Good afternoon, and welcome to a webinar on temporary FSB requirements in the era of COVID-19, hosted by EAS Consulting Group and presented by EAS Independent Consultant, Brian Ravitch. EAS, a member of the certified family of companies, is a global leader in regulatory solutions for industries regulated by FDA, USDA, and other state and federal agencies. Our network of over 150 independent advisors and consultants enables EAS to provide comprehensive consulting, training, and auditing services, ensuring proactive regulatory compliance. Today's presenter is Brian Ravitch. Brian's career spanned positions such as a NOAA seagoing biologist and roles at FDA, including import inspector, domestic investigator, and food seafood HACCP specialist. He has also worked in ORA's Office of Human and Animal Food Operations as one of seven national food program experts. Since the implementation of FISMA, Brian has played key roles in the development and implementation of the Foreign Supplier Verification Program. He is also trained in preventive controls for human foods. As a reminder, during the webinar, you may ask any questions by typing them into the questions box. And with that, I will turn the presentation over to Brian. Thank you, Amy. Um, thanks everybody for joining and happy Cinco de Mayo. Um, I was also going to mention, I recently retired from FDA in December of 2019 after 25 years of working with FDA and 39 years of federal service. Um, as Amy mentioned, um, during my last seven years, um, I've worked as a subject matter expert overseeing the development of FSBP, the Foreign Supplier Verification Program. Um, I uh, helped with writing the regulations, um, helping with writing the guidance for industry, um, also um, the development of the um, training program for regulators, and I was also involved in teaching the regulators. So um, I have a broad range of knowledge when it comes to the Foreign Supplier Verification Program and also um, supply chain management. Um, today I was going to spend a little time talking and discussing a couple temporary FDA policies that have recently been issued, um, along with giving you a little background information um, in regards to the different regulations that these policy changes affect. Uh, you can see on this side slide, um, there are three FISMA uh, regulations which are being affected um, by this current um, COVID-19 public health emergency situation. Currently, FDA will not be enforcing the supply chain verification requirements of on-site audits methods are used instead. Um, the three regulations which are um, currently affected by this policy change um, would be preventive controls for human food under subpart G, which is the supply chain provision. Also preventive control for um, animal food, which is um, found under subpart E and the Foreign Supplier Verification Program, um, which is found under 21 CFR Part 1.500. Uh oh, I'm sorry. So, um, either you've received a copy of this presentation or will be receiving a copy of um, the slides that I'll be using, um, but you can see here um, there are links to the policies, the two policies, um, one concerning with the on-site audit requirements during the COVID-19 
um, public health emergency, and the second one dealing with temporarily conducting remote importer inspections under the FSVP program. For companies that are required to establish a supply chain program for their ingredients or finished products, um, they must perform one of the four um, verification activities. I'm having some difficulties. Um, here we go. Um, so these activities include on-site audits, sampling or testing, review of the supplier's relevant food safety records, or other appropriate activities which would confirm the performance or risk associated with the food. Um, all of these activities are included within the regulations for each one of the three um, regulations which I had mentioned. Um, if there is a reasonable probability that a hazard controlled by the supplier will cause serious adverse health consequences or death to humans or animals, which um, the acronym is SACOTA, most of you have probably seen this acronym coined by FDA, um, the, de the default verification activity is an annual on-site audit um, before initially obtaining the food or ingredient and at least annually thereafter. Under these conditions, you may temporarily select an alternative verification activity as long as it is sufficient to assure the hazards requiring it control has been minimized or prevented. It's important also to understand uh, that if you are to use a different uh, verification activity other than on-site audit, that you need to um, modify your food safety plan or your FSVP. Um, under this policy, it states that, um, like I had mentioned, FDA uh, will not enforce the use of an on-site audit if the supplier is due for an on-site audit and they're located either in a region or a country covered by a government travel restriction or travel advisory and um, the receiving facility or, FD, or the foreign supplier importer is unable to um, obtain the services of a qualified auditor, or if you're um, going to do the auditing that um, the travel to that supplier um, is impossible to conduct an on-site audit. receiving, um, just for a little background here, a receiving facility is a facility that is subject to um, preventive controls that manufacture or process a raw material or ingredient that is received from a supplier. Um, the receiving facility or FDA importer may temporarily select an alternative verification activity. Um, examples of this might be um, if uh, you had um, an audit which is delayed, um, you may um, suggest that uh, the uh, is good for maybe two years or maybe three years along with maybe a questionnaire and um, a letter confirming that um, the firm is continually being 
um, in compliance with their last um, audit. Another thing you might um, suggest would be sampling or testing. You might want to receive um, lot by lot testing um, documentation to show that the food that you're receiving is in compliance with um, FSVP or preventive control regulations. Um, food safety plan or foreign supplier verification programs must be modified to incorporate the alternative activities or um, either that activity or activities um, that you choose to use um, in the place of the on-site audit. As I mentioned, a little background for um, people that um, don't know the definition of a receiving facility, or if this is a new term for you, a receiving facility um, is a facility, like I said, that was uh, subject to preventive requ requirement and that the manufacturer, you either manufacture or process the raw materials or other ingredients um, that you receive from that supplier. Um, there's also um, a provision under FSVP which um, states that if you're receiving a preventive control program under um, either for animal food or for um, human food, that you're in compliance with FSVP. Um, you'll note that a lot of the um, regulations concerning with supply chain, um, the language is quite similar when you compare it to the animal food, um, the human food, and FSVP. And the reason for that is when FDA were writing these regulations, they were writing them in tandem so that um, the definitions and uh, the way the language reads is similar for all three regulations. So FDA will provide a timely notice of their withdrawal of this policy. Um, it'll be your responsibility to revert back to the original verification activity within a reasonable period of time. Remember also, if you modify your program, that it'll need to be signed and dated um, of this modification. So the other thing that I think is important to um, remember about this situation is um, prior to this pandemic, we never thought that this might be a situation. It's probably best for all of you to go back to your su supply chain provisions as you've currently written them. And you might want to include a situation such as um, a pandemic. I'm out in Southern California. I know one of the problems we have here are fires. Last year, we had um, huge problems with fires throughout the state. So there may be other reasons than just this pandemic um, in the future that maybe you haven't thought about where it may not be possible to go to different locations to conduct some of these verification activities. So it's probably something, um, especially now with this pandemic, to go back to your, um, your written policies, your written programs, and take a look at it. And um, it, like I said, not only for this pandemic, but there may be other reasons in the future why one verification activity might not be able to be accomplished. And under those conditions, you can um, have this written in your plan and um, there shouldn't be a problem um, if you have to use an alternative uh, verification activity. So the next thing I'm gonna talk about, um, dear to my heart here, 
is um, this temporary use of remote um, FSVP importer inspections um, during the COVID-19 um, outbreak. As of April, FDA will be conducting remote FSVP inspections um, of foreign suppliers whose on-site food facilities um, and farm inspections were postponed due to um, traveling concerns from the agency. Um, also included, FDA has um, stated that uh, previously assigned FSVP inspections, including reinspections, may also be conducted now remotely. So FSVP rule, um, for some of you um, that may or may not be familiar with this, uh, requires importers to perform a certain risk-based activities to verify that their foreign suppliers are producing food in accordance with U.S. food safety standards. Um, in the past, FDA, up until this time, have been conducting these inspections um, on site at the location of the importer. Uh, now with this um, situation where um, FDA, um, their investigators are not traveling, um, we're looking at the possibility of um, conducting these inspections remotely. I know that there hasn't been very many of these inspections conducted um, since this guidance have come out. There's maybe 20 of them that have been performed. Um, some of you might be wondering where this information, how is it that FDA has the authority to conduct these inspections remotely? When the regulation was written under the FSVP record keeping requirements, um, they had stated in request um, the importer must promptly send the agency FSVP records either electronically or by other means. So what I wanted to do here was just give you a little overview of what the FSVP um, requirements are. Um, this is outside of um, conducting these remotely. Um, this is more about what the program is all about. Um, so the first thing that has to be done is you need to conduct a hazard analysis to determine whether there are any hazards that require control um, by the foreign supplier. So this is really the backbone of this uh, regulation. Um, based on the hazard, if there's hazards present, then you need to um, then follow some of the other um, requirements that I've listed here. If hazards aren't required, um, you um, may be able to get by with just having a written hazard analysis. But if you do have hazards requiring controls, um, the next thing you need to do is evaluate um, and approve each of your foreign suppliers based on performance and food safety history. As you can see, I've also written the different sections of the regulation where each one of these can be found. Um, once you've, de once you've evaluated and approved um, your foreign supplier, um, the importer must establish and follow written procedures to ensure that they're only importing from the suppliers that have been approved. Um, also based on the hazards, 
um, you have to determine an appropriate verification activity and frequency. Um, you must determine which one is to be used. You need to implement it and you need to document those um, activities. Um, the, the foreign supplier verification activities must provide assurance that the hazards requiring a control in the imported food has um, significantly minimized or prevented um, the hazard. If applicable, you need to take appropriate corrective actions. Um, there is also a provision within the regulation that at the time of entry for each food line item, you need to identify yourself. Um, you need to provide an email address and you also need to provide um, a DUNS number. And that would all be done through a customs broker at the time they're entering the line entries through um, the customs system. And the next requirement would be record keeping. Um, again, this is just a fast overview for people that are on this call. Um, if people have questions or concerns about their program, um, they can always contact myself. Of um, or the consulting firm. So this is probably um, one of the more important slides that people have been um, waiting for. So how will remote inspections work? Um, the, the first thing that I should um, let everybody know is from the very beginning when we first um, started to conduct our inspections, um, Remote inspections were always in on the back burner. Um, FDA management, um, we were having discussions of when and how remote inspections might be used. But up until the time of the pandemic, um, there really wasn't any consideration as to conducting these remote inspections. One of the considerations were possibly conducting remote inspections um, as re-inspections. So if somebody, if an importer had already been inspected and there were deficiencies, maybe we would do a re-inspection remotely or possibly if a firm was on import alert that we could simply, after um, receiving a corrective actions, we may be able to do something like that remotely. But up until now, um, we, uh, the agency, I'm sorry, hadn't um, any, any uh, remote inspections. But presently, what happens is there's going to be a pre-inspection phone call. This phone call, if it, it may be a phone call or it could also be an email, um, like I had mentioned, at the time of entry, you're supposed to supply an email. So, um, and then with that, there would be some communication prior to the inspection, most likely a follow up with a telephone call. Um, during that call, there's going to be um, some dialogue. Uh, the investigator will determine if you are in fact the FSBP importer. They'll make sure your identity is correct. And at that time, they're going to supply you either verbally or electronically with instructions in regards to sending your FSBP records, um, which are going to be requested by the investigator. The next thing that's going to happen is once there's been this communication, there's going to be an issuance of a form FD482D, which is um, the request for FDA records. Um, some of you might be wondering why, the, what's the difference between an FD482, which is a notice to inspect, and an F. D482D, which is a request for FSVP records. 
Well, at the time when we were developing this program, um, we needed to develop a new request for records instead of using the typical 482 notice for inspection. Under FSVP, our inspection authority comes from 805 of the Act instead of the typical 704 section of the Act for conducting inspections. The reason for this is many of the FSVP importers don't fall under the definition, which is very specific under the 704 inspection authority. It says that we can inspect importers, but under the definition of FSVP, many of these importers aren't the typical importer. It's a different definition. So for instance, some FSVP importers are restaurant owners. Um, they're not typical importers. They may be grocery stores. They, they're entities that FDA in the past um, hadn't necessarily inspected. So because of this, we created a 482D form, which gives us um, the authority to request FSVP records and make copies. Uh, once this F or FD 482 is issued and you've received it, you're going to be prompt to deliver um, records that have been identified. Within the regulation, it says that you're supposed to send them promptly. So there's no real um, guidance when it comes to when is the required amount of time for these documents to be supplied. Within the regulation, there is um, some verbiage that says if official records are, are held off site, you have 24 hours to um, get those records for review for um, an FDA investigator. It's my understanding talking with um, some of the policymakers of the FDA that there will be flexibility in the amount of time to get these records to FDA. Um, the next thing that's going to happen is once the records are received by FDA, the investigator will take some time to review them and then they're going to be conducting an inspection virtually with the importer. Um, that could be just like we're doing now through some um, web-based um, application. It might just be via a telephone call. Um, as they're reviewing and having these discussions with you, um, it'll be typical um, as any other type of FDA inspection. Um, they'll ask you questions. They'll look at the paperwork. Um, if in fact there are um, deviations or observations with the, which the investigator um, has noted, um, they will either discuss these deviations with you or more likely they're going to um, put them on an, a form FD483A, which is an FSVP um, observations form. And they will then transmit that form to you electronically. Once that form is received, they are, there will be a discussion with management, um, just like a typical FDA inspection, which is held on site. And there'll also be a closeout of the inspection. So I put together a slide here of do's and don'ts. I just wanted to refer to my notes here for a second. Um, so typically, um, you know, this is going to be a new process, not just for FDA, but um, for, for you. So you're kind of in the same boat here. Um, 
So some of these are just our common sense. Other things I think it's important that you understand and realize, but make sure you have a full understanding of the scope of the inspection. So if you have any questions up front, um, make sure you discuss this with the investigators. Have a full understanding of the documentation that they're requesting. Um, typically, uh, for people um, that haven't been inspected under the FSVP program, um, most of the inspections will consist of looking at three separate programs. That would mean three separate articles of food um, that you've imported. Um, in some cases, um, maybe you only import one type of food from one manufacturer, then in that case, maybe they would only look at that individual um, product. But in most cases, the um, inspections have consisted of three different programs. So that could be three products from the same foreign supplier, or it could be products from different foreign suppliers. So be prepared, like I said, understand the scope of the inspection and know what documents you're supposed to be sending. Um, once you receive that 482D, make sure that you submit um, the records um, promptly. If there's some reason that you feel that it's going to take you more time, discuss that with the investigator. Um, who knows, there might be illness in your family and um, for that reason, it's going to take more time. But be upfront with the investigator and let them know what's happening. In some cases, your records may be in a foreign language. And before they can be sent to FDA, they need to be translated into English. The regulation under FSVP is very specific. Any records that we request have to be in English. If they're not in English at the time that we request it, um, the investigator will give you time to translate those records. So again, whatever might come up, make sure you discuss it with the investigator so they understand it may take a little bit longer to receive the information. Um, the next thing is if your program is written, which is acceptable, and if it, it may not be electronic, you still have the means to um, send those documents either through the mail or through um, a carrier. If that's the case, just make sure that these are copies and not the original documents. Um, FDA is not going to be returning these documents to you. So um, you'll need to make sure that you retain your original documents. Um, the next bullet here, I feel is really important. Like I said in the beginning, this is a new program. And a new program, not only program, but a new way of conducting these inspections. So you, you need to be patient. Um, both you and um, the FDA investigator really need to work together to uh, make these types of inspections happen. Um, be prepared um, to be available once FDA receives and reviews your records. Like I said, it, you know, it may be over um, the telephone or it may be a video chat program, but um, if if it was myself, I would be prepared to and even suggest to have it via a video chat pro, um, platform. At the same time, just like we're sharing our um, PowerPoint to give this presentation, you could bring up your record keeping. You could work with the investigator to understand which record he wants to review first. You can bring that record up. Um, and you can review it together. It may be an easier way um, to be able to conduct these inspections. Um, the other thing that's important is um, 
if need be, other people can be on this phone call or the video chat. Um, if you have uh, regulatory um, people that help to develop this program, or you might have a qualified individual like a consultant, um, you might even want to have um, a, a lawyer helping or representing you. Um, so you just let the F FDA investigator know that you're going to want to have additional people on the telephone. There should be no reason why that can't happen. Um, the next is via um, video chat, if possible. I think at the end of the day that this is really going to be the best way to do it. I know for um, some of the inspections that I had conducted prior to leaving FDA, um, both from preventive control um, and FSBP, that working working together, having these um, having these documents in an electronic form. Um, often it's difficult. Um, FDA might ask you for something. You might not understand exactly the terminology. You may have that record under some other program. Uh, so it's going to be really important to have that communication and to be able to understand and um, know what the FDA investigator is looking at. So you can make sure that if he feels there may be deviations, this is a good way to be able to show, now wait a minute, here's, here's really what we have. Um, any deviation should be discussed during the um, inspection. Um, FSVP inspections are no different than um, other inspections. Although we're just looking at uh, paperwork, um, instead of the actual processing or determining if there's GMP violations. Um, you should also um, be prepared if they, if the investigator feels that there's deviations, you should be prepared to discuss those. Um, also um, be prepared to do um, discuss what sort of corrective action plan you're going to take and how long the timing that it might take um, to complete um, these corrections. Um, also, after the inspection, just like um, I keep mentioning any other FDA inspection, it's very important to um, give a written response back to the agency and these are typically due within 15 working days. <clears throat> if you're not sure where this response should be sent um, during the inspection, ask the investigator and they should be able to give you um, some information as to um, who and where to send these responses to. Uh, let me see here. Um, this last slide that I have, um, I think it's um, it's important. I wanted to um, emphasize the consequences of enforcement. You know, up until the pandemic and conducting these inspections uh, remotely, I think people looked at FSBP as just another import program, maybe having less significance. But as I had mentioned in the beginning of these slides, under the new policy, um, many of the inspections which were, um, were to be inspected both domestically and um, more importantly from FSBP perspective overseas, which are not canceled, they're utilizing the FSBP program to ensure that these foreign manufacturers are in compliance with um, a like regulation of preventive control, some sort of risk-based um, 
a, a risk-based uh, program. So when, when the FSVP uh, regulation was written under 1.514, these are the consequences that may occur if you're not in compliance with the regulation. The first thing that's important to know is there is a prohibited act specifically for FSVP um, for this program. You need to, re um, to meet the requirements under Section 805 of the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. The prohibited act is 301ZZ. And based on that prohibited act, if you are in violation of FSVP, um, FDA has the authority to refuse admission of your um, entries. Um, the other thing that has been developed, um, and so far there is one uh, company that's on an import alert, it's import alert 9941, um, detention without physical examination of human and animal food imported from foreign suppliers by importers who are not in compliance with the requirements of FSVP regulations. Um, the import alert is set up so that it's specific to an importer that is not in compliance with FSVP for a specific food from a specific foreign supplier. Um, some people, again, might think, well, the consequences really aren't so severe. They, I import other food. Well, maybe this food I just won't import. Um, in most cases, you have to look at it more broadly. There are some foreign suppliers that only import to one individual importer in the United States. If for some reason that importer is put on this import alert, Essentially, that means that foreign supplier um, cannot continue to bring their products into the United States unless they can find a different importer to um, bring in their products. So it's very important that you look at these consequences. The other thing is, regardless if the inspection is conducted uh, remotely, or if it's conducted on site, these enforcement um, tools um, are still applicable. It doesn't matter if you are inspected, like I said, remotely, it holds the same enforcement authority. So just remember that. So I think this was the last slide that I had. Um, I'm, I'm going to turn it over to Amy. If anybody has any questions, um, I think Amy is having you um, write in the questions. So hopefully we can answer those questions for you. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Brian. And yes, there's a Q&A uh, box in your Zoom application. If you'd like to ask any questions, just send it there. Um, I want to thank Brian for our presentation on FSCP, and of course, as you know, if you have any questions ever on any order, um, needing assistance, uh, getting a DUNS number, EAS, of course, is able to help you with all of those items. Um, Brian, our first question is regarding the use of a different verification activity other than the on-site audit. What do I do if an FDA investigator challenges the adequacy of our temporary activity? I had to get off mute here. Um, so as I mentioned during the presentation, you'll be required to modify your written supply chain procedure um, if you're going to use some sort of other activity than the on-site audit. Um, I really doubt that the investigation, the investigator may challenge um, the selected activity, but I think it's important that when you're writing um, this new section within your supply chain program, that you might want to add some justification as to um, why you've chosen the verification activity 
um, that you're choosing. And with that, it's almost similar to having a validation. Of course, you don't have to go into that much detail, but I think it's always helpful to have additional information within your program as to the reasoning why you've selected um, these activities that you selected. So hopefully that helps. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question, does the translation of records in a foreign language, from a foreign language into English, uh, need to be certified by an authority or institution? No, um, it doesn't. But, you know, when we were writing the regulation and looking at this term qualified individual, um, we would hope that there would be a qualified individual, for instance, if your records are in Chinese, that you have a qualified individual that would be able to read and translate these um, records. Um, obviously, if you're receiving records, part of the requirement of the regulation is for you to review and assess these records. So um, there has to be somebody um, that you can rely on for this translation to ensure that the records you're receiving are adequate um, for um, the intent and purpose of receiving them. Okay, thank you for that. Will, uh, will FDA ask for specific records within your FSVP or just ask for the FSVP for a particular product? Um, um, I'm thinking here a second how to answer this question because obviously um, I, I'm not with FDA anymore, so I don't know their exact protocol, but typically, um, during an on-site inspection, the regulators have been taught um, to have a systematic approach. Typically, um, as an as a, um, investigator, I've taught other investigators to request records kind of one at a time. Like I said, the cornerstone of um, FSBP is the hazard analysis. So really the first record we would want to look at would be that written hazard analysis. From um, the written ha hazard analysis, we can then make a determination what other records are required for that specific program. Um, FDA um, typically will ask for all the records. Um, so it's going to be important that um, one by one, you can discuss those records that you've submitted um, to FDA. Hopefully, if you're an importer of, let's say, a hundred different products, I doubt that they're going to ask for all hundred programs. They're going to have to narrow their, your focus um, or their focus to um, specific uh, food product from a specific foreign supplier. Can you advise how the FDA might prioritize which inspections they will do virtually first compared to last? Um, well, the policy that was issued um, specifically states, and I kind of read it right out of the policy, that the, the inspections that they're going to be doing remotely first are going to be um, the foreign inspections that were due to be inspected. So if there's, let's say, some firm in Italy that have already been notified that FDA in May was going to be there to conduct their inspection, that would be a higher priority inspection because that was already set up and now has to be canceled. So what we do is we look I say we, I apologize. Um, I've just been out of the agency um, a little time. I keep considering myself as we, but um, the agency, what they're going to do is they're going to look um, in their importing systems. There's many databases and they can simply put in um, the information for the firm in Italy, they'll see who's importing products from that firm 
and then they'll go to that importer and look at their verification program. So I would say that that's going to probably be the, of the highest priority. The next priority is going to be re-inspection. So if somebody's already been inspected and they've been issued a 483, in most cases for not having an FSBP program, that would probably be the second highest priority and that would be considered a re-inspection. It's very important that if you're notified and you had dis discrepancies or maybe didn't have a program, if in fact you're being asked to send those documentation in now for a remote inspection and you still don't have anything in place, um, the, the course of action is most likely you're gonna be receiving a warning letter and at um, that point, it's very important to start working on a plan, have some sort of corrective action moving forward because you're gonna be getting a warning letter and if there's still no action done, you will be re um, placed on that import alert that I mentioned earlier. And what are the biggest gaps FDA has found in the FSCP programs inspected to date? Well, there's been a lot of um, uh, lectures and FDA people um, giving um, these talks to industry where they've broken down the 483 items. And really by far the largest one is just not having a program at all. I would say the next thing is not identifying um, specific hazards that um, are significant. Um, that would be um, something that the investigator would find, but you um, did not um, identify those hazards. So I would say really the big things would be those two um, situations, not having a plan at all and not identifying specific hazards. It looks like our last question. Uh, would you just talk a little bit about the, uh, how the uh, auditing program is set up? Where are the inspectors? Uh, how many inspections do they expect to do each year? Mm. You know, um, starting the, the inspection started in 2017. So in 2017, um, we didn't start conducting inspections until about June. And our fiscal year ends at the end of September. So there were just a small amount of inspections, I think less than 500. And then the next year, we, um, uh, the agency, I think it was close to a thousand inspections. But then there was also um, the year past where we had a situation where there was a furlough. Um, also the way the FSVP regulation was written, um, we would begin inspections um, six months after the um, preventive control regulation went into effect. So there was different timing for different sections of the regulation. In the very beginning for preventive control, it was the largest firms. It was firms with over 500 employees. And so with that six months later, we would only inspect FSBT importers that were identified as importing from those largest firms. But now we're at the point where almost any, um, any firm around the world, including farms, have now been implemented. So I, um, when I left the agency, I think they were up to around 1,500 inspections um, for 2020. And some of those were to include re-inspections, maybe 10%. And then they were also going to begin um, a smaller number of farms. So that would mean if you're an, an importer of produce, 
that you would that need to have the applicable documentation um, that the farms were under the produce rule if they were foreign farms. So hopefully that will help the person. Um, the other thing that I should point out is because the um, because of this regulation where people have to identify themselves at the time of entry, um, every new importer is being put onto a list. Originally, the agency had a number of about 32,000. They figured their importers. When I left the agency, that list of importers was well beyond 75,000 importers. So there's a lot of importers out there and not so many um, investigators to be able to conduct these inspections. But with that said, the agency, are they also have many, many different types of databases. They can see the values of your entries. They can look at the product codes of your entries, meaning they know what type of products are coming in. They can concentrate on high risk, high volume. Um, the other thing, when we were looking at um, the importation over the years, there's very few importers um, considering how many line entries are brought in. Just off the top of my head, I had developed an upside down pyramid. So if you look, um, I think it's, I, I want to say six or seven percent, bring in 53 percent of the volume. So it's a very small amount of importers that are actually bringing in the largest volume of food into this country. So if we concentrated and just inspected three or 400 FSVP importers, we're actually looking at as much as 60 or 70% of all the food items that enter into the United States. So there's many importers that only import one or two or five or 10 lines in a year. And that might be less significant than an importer that is bringing in hundreds of lines a, day, a, a week or in a month, thousands of lines. So um, the agency does have ways to prioritize um, how, how they're looking and developing these work plans. All right, great. Well, thank you everyone for such uh, good questions. And Brian, thank you again for the presentation. I will note um, Alan's phone number on the slide if you have any questions is 571-447-5509. Uh, you can reach him at asailor at easconsultinggroup.com. Alan is our Senior Director for Food Consulting Services. Of course, you have Brian's information as well uh, and the EAS website. And uh, again, I want to thank everyone for joining us today, as always. Uh, we appreciate your interest in EAS. We've recorded the webinar, and it will be up uh, on our website, hopefully within a few days. And we look forward to seeing you at a future webinar. Thanks again. Thank you, Amy.